Regional Director of the UNDP, Regional Director of the CA, Representative of Dr. Imo Sawyer, distinguished members of the UN, UNDP family, civil society leaders, distinguished academics and analysts, including our very respected Nana Dr. SKB Asante, a chief of great renown and an academic. It's a pleasure to be with you uh, this morning. My good friend who just spoke reminds me of our old days in analyzing democracy and good governance in Africa. And now he's cool. He used to be uh, more strong in his speech and they're more inspiring, you know, by way of making us doing something good for Africa. In my few remarks, I would like us to look at this matter in terms of what are some of the challenges in the quest for good governance? Politically, is it agenda finished or a luta continua, like we love to say? And then secondly, since it's also a matter of development that is before us, to what extent is this agenda being feathered or inhibited by our lack of development? And definitely, this meeting would like to consider what are some of the processes of governance that we've not done too well upon? Personally, I tend to be rather pessimistic in view of some of the challenges that continue to rear their rather unpleasant heads from time to time. Are we certain about the rules of the game? And even in our country here, we continue to have a number of hiccups as a result of the mere presentation and representation and interpretation of the rules of the game. And that is quite dangerous. It should not be a situation that any electoral boss can, at the eve of the election, bring about rules and regulations which tend to be contentious. I believe Africa, working in tandem, should be able to compare and establish the best practices for the electoral process. And we can so establish these processes that any person anywhere who tries to go contrary to the established norm will quickly be condemned by the rest of, the Afri of Africa, because this you just cannot do. Within the same contest, limitation of tenure is crucial. Can we have an Africa, an ECOWAS just watching on, or an Africa Union just looking on, as some president wants to rule forever? and we see the hand of manipulation in such a process. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, with regard to the example of the European Union, for example, we see that Spain and Portugal wanted to become members of the EU, were prevented from doing so because by the European standard, members of the Union 
felt their democratic credentials were not strong enough. What are the established democratic credentials in Africa? And no one is going to do for that for us. And until we establish these principles, the pillars of good governance as we see it, by way of the best practices and our own development in that regard, that anybody can do his own thing. This, I believe, will help us to consolidate democracy and good governance in Africa. Today, the rights of women continue to nimble on the periphery. Generally speaking, political representation in African parliaments are some 25% of the populace, when women are generally about 51% of the population. Shall we continue to take these things for granted or bring out serious affirmative action laws so as to protect the rights and improve upon the rights of women. Until we get this aspect right, then of course we are still dangling and not moving forward in the process of deepening democracy and good governance in our various countries. I used to say that it's like a person running a race and consciously tying one leg behind him or her and still wants to win the race. In the, the race for good governance and also development, we cannot approach the, the struggle with this kind of attitude. It's a matter, actually, of using the law as an instrument of social engineering in the process of consolidating good governance and also bringing about development. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, as we look at the electoral arrangements that regulate the process in Africa, we realize that donors played a very important role in our elections and they continue to do so. Now we also know they are becoming rather donor wary. What kind of arrangements do we envisage in filling this obvious gap and doing things ourselves? For example, if we were to have a West Africa Electoral Commission, something I've been very, very, very much uh, keen upon. We have a West Africa Examinations Council. In fact, there was a time when we even had a West Africa Cocoa Research Institute and all manner of arrangements. Let there be any war in one of our countries, we will quickly have an ECOMOG going to intervene. Forgetting that many of these also have got electoral dimensions. A lot of conflict arises in Africa from elections, directly or indirectly. What do we do about this? If you had a West Africa Electoral Commission, the register, which become a bone of contention, can become international. You cannot be on the Cote d'Ivoire register, on the Togo register, and on the Ghana register at the same time, because there's one credible international register, if you may so say. And yet, we, we forget about such simple arrangements, sometimes under the cover of sovereignty, which sovereignty, of course, quickly diffuses when there is civil war, and we need our, our brothers and sisters to come and assist us in those dimensions. So what do we do about this, for example? If we had a powerful West Africa Electoral Commission, they themselves become a regulatory body so that no one person, 
resident or monarch can do whatever he or she likes in his or her backyard. In other words, a systematic internationalization of the process, applying the best practices for our mutual benefit. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Franz Fanon, Karl Marx, I was not enamored with socialists as a scholar, no doubt about that. And my, my views are well known. But there is something in some of the statements they made. If Karl Marx says the poor have nothing to lose by their chains, you cannot ignore it. In fact, the Western countries did not ignore this. That's why today, even in America, there are food stamps for the poor. The poor must not be so, uh, so poor and unprovided for that they become a danger to the man on the street. It's, it's, it's a fact. And in Britain, we all know about the subsidies on potatoes, milk, chicken, and a few things that will prevent even the African students from being too poor in circumstances that most of us know. Now, if we consider the wretched of the earth, which Franz Fanon wrote so much about, and very much in line with what my good friend talked about just before me, we therefore see the need for a new world economic order in order to sustain democracy. We, when we have growing graduate unemployed young people, when we have plans of educating our people even more, then we must have plans to employ them and provide for them economically even more. And we are not able to sustain this. And this is why Africa must speak with one voice towards this new world economic order with regard to these provisions concerning the world order as it is today. WTO. We cannot keep on exporting only the raw materials preferred by the West. How do we apply our mater raw materials ourselves in a way that they are processed, in a way that we have factories, in a way that we generate internal uh, development to match the expectations of our newly educated young people. This English, ladies and gentlemen, unless we have an answer to this, democracy may not be sustainable. The poor person is gullible. We have to remove poverty, misery, and disease. Because when a person continues to live a life miserably below the poverty level. That person is very ripe material for, the, for use by revolutionaries. And if we want stability, good governance, a government that is responsive, like we heard this morning, and I believe very much in responsiveness, such that people can also participate, interrogate the governors and be part and parcel of the process. When that happens, then of course, that is positively, then democracy will be strengthened. If it does not happen positively, then you will see that sooner than later, people will begin to ask, but will the vote bring me food on the table? And that is something that will ensure that the good Lord will forbid. So, the distinguished ladies and gentlemen, WTO arrangements, which prevent even our, our chicken industry from growing, because the United States at one time positively intervened with regard to the importation of chicken 
by Ghana when we try some regulatory measures. And therefore, this misorder of the world economic system, when shall we overcome? How shall we overcome? And if we did not, what will sustain democracy? I believe that these are some real challenges facing us, and we should get answers to them sooner than later in order to celebrate democracy and good governance in the next 10 or 20 years. In 1988, when the second wind of change that you all know of blew, Africa rose up. Shall we sustain the present system? And if not, shall we in 10 years or 20 years now be crying for a third wind of change? This is a challenge facing us. And I trust that this conference will be able to conceptualize and articulate some of the various issues that will come out of this main problem. I thank you and wish you well. <laughs>